Hello, and welcome back. You are watching Authors Recommend Books. I am Bradley Verdell, author of steampunk and Victorian fantasy, such as the Chatwick Yates series. And you are... Who are you? I'm Mark Will, author of... Well, translator of... Fernando Pessoa's Message. You translated this book. Tell I us did. about that. Well, uh, the original was written in Portuguese, and uh, I don't know Portuguese, but I know Latin and some Spanish. So with my knowledge of those languages and a uh, good Portuguese English dictionary and a verb chart, I did it. Wow, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. And you can buy his translation on Amazon. I'll put the links uh, in the description. And uh, I would... Uh, be hugely appreciative um, if you read our books and uh, if you do, please leave us a review on Amazon because uh, reviews are worth more than cold hard cash on Amazon. Uh, reviews are you know, we live for reviews you know, rev there's one thing you can do to help self-publish Amazon authors out that helps more than anything, well besides buying a book, is um, leaving, leaving a review an honest review. Okay <clears throat> today we have, uh, we're going to switch things up a bit. Usually I do a non-fiction recommendation and Mark does a fiction recommendation. I'm going to do a sort of fiction, sort of non-fiction, and you're going to do a non-fiction. So, um, but we still are going to give you two book recommendations today, and these are not paid advertisements. Um, they're just books that we've read and we like, and we don't get any kind of money or kickback for, from recommending these books. Um, last time I recommended another author who is dead, so uh, there's no way I could be getting a kickback for that. In fact, that book is free online, I found out. Mm. Um, but uh, my book today is called Game Birds and Gun Dogs, and um, the reason I say it's sort of fiction, sort of nonfiction, it is a short story collection of uh, true stories. So it's, it has an element of... of uh, well, the, the writing style comes into play as it would in fiction, you know, as, as far as the emotion and the feeling that you get from the story. Um, there, there's a lot of the fiction writer's craft in it, but these are, are true stories. Um, so there are multiple authors, but it is edited by Vin T. Sperano. If you're having trouble uh, finding the book, you can put that in. The, the title, Game Birds and Gun Dogs, is not fair at all, in my view. Um, I wanted to read a book of hunting stories, and I got a book on of hunting stories, which is fantastic. But like all hunting stories, the way it's advertised is not a good reflection of what it is. If you think, um, if you haven't read stories written by hunters or hunting stories or you know sort of uh, fishing, wildlife kind of outdoor sportsman stories, um, you may not know that these stories are invariably about people and their relationships, and, and it's, it's so much deeper and so much more than uh, a book about hunting. You know, I surf, and you definitely get this with surfing. Surfing is so much more than surfing. Surfing means something to people that's so much deeper that it's really hard to know what it is unless you surf, but there's a connection to the ocean and a connection to other surfers, and it's a process of self-discovery, and it's, it's a very deep thing. It's not just a hobby. And hunting is definitely like that. Um, I finished this book <clears throat> recently when I was visiting Hong Kong with my editor, Pat Woods. And we were sitting in what I believe is the finest cigar lounge. And we were both uh, on the last maybe 10% uh, Kindle of a book we were reading. Mm -hmm. So we hung out in the cigar lounge and we drank Chinese tea and smoked cigars in this beautiful environment until we finished are, are the books that we were reading. We right. basically both finished a book at the same time. And uh, mine finished up beautifully because the last story is from a writer who wrote in the mid-1850s. And it's like a proper old-timey uh, hunt where they, you know, take champagne along with the with their, you know, servant carrying the champagne and the game bags and they chill the champagne in a stream and they're shooting woodcock all day and walking for nine hours through... Uh, the Warwick Woodlands, and it's just a beautiful atmospheric story about friendship and the love of hunting. But um, the main thing I want to say to sell this book, 
uh, and convince you that you should buy this. If you look at the cover, you wouldn't think this is a book that would make you cry. But this book made me weep twice. Hmm. Okay, there are 15 stories in this book. Two of them had me bawling. Okay, and I actually have a funny story that I want to share about this. Uh, I was reading the story called Gypsy, which is the best story in the book, in my opinion. Well, it's the best story emotionally. Uh, there, the, the other best story in the book is hilarious, and I was laughing the whole way through it. And I'll get to that one in a second. But the story called Gypsy, I started reading this, um, and I was reading it on my lunch break at work, and I was in Subway. And we live in Taipei, Taiwan, so we're expats living in a foreign country. But I went to Subway for lunch, the American uh, sub chain, and I'm reading this story, and it's about a dog. And I just know something bad is going to happen to this dog, and I, 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 need to st I should stop reading this right now. And I finished the story and so I started crying. <laughs> and I'm just weeping over here. And there's one Taiwanese person uh, across from me. And they must have been looking at me like that guy is looking at an iPad and just crying over there. And it, it occurred to me too late what I should have done. What I should have done was... Uh, instead of looking at the book, but with, with tears streaming down on my face, I should have held my Subway sandwich and looked at that person and said in Chinese, it tastes just like home. <laughs> <laughs> they, would, they would always get to tell their friends that. I saw this white dude in Subway crying because it tasted like home and he was homesick. But um, the book, uh, Gypsy, and uh, another story called Nat's Dog, Man, they just get to the heart of humans' relationship with dogs. Mm -hmm. And the whole, I mean, we have such a long history with dogs. And there's, um, you know, I'm one of these people that thinks, you know, there's no love like the, the love of a dog, you know. It's just pure and unlimited and it, it's, oh, it's heartbreaking. There's so many heartbreaking stories. It's mainly about people and dogs and people and their friends and uh, people and their families. And another I wish story. you had told me you were doing this. I would have pimped my story from Taiwan Tales. Oh, too. yeah. Well, I was going to bring that up, actually. Okay. Yeah, because the, the story Nat's Dog, you would love it, is uh, narrated partially by the dog. Uh, and your story about Mau Mau and Bao Bao is narrated by a dog. And But his is funny. This one is sad. Oh, it's so sad. Um, and in that story, I'll just say that um, the it's about... It's about the dog of a, a, a man who's a hunter who dies. And the, the dog um, is left to his widow, his wife. Mm -hmm. And his wife was only kind of into hunting because her husband was into hunting. And she thinks, um, you know, the, it, it's about them trying to overcome the, the grief together. And... Um, I'll just say that it, the, the, the interesting quirk of the story that, that ends up becoming just fascinating is that the dog will only give birds to him, basically. Mm. So if he's hunting with his friends and the dog retrieves a bird and somebody else says, oh, give, give, it won't. It will only give birds right. to him, but he's dead now. And um, the story revolves around this, and it's a very short story, but my goodness, it's fantastic. Um the funniest story in the book, uh, so I would suggest, say out of the 15 stories, there's Gypsy, Nat's Dog, A Boy's First Turkey, all fantastic, very emotional stories. Um, there's also a, a, a more of a technical hunting story that I think is worth mentioning called The Ultimate Game Bird. It talks about a bird which I believe is called the Himalayan Snow Partridge, which only lives above four or five thousand feet or something like that only in one range of mountains and I believe Arizona hmm. and there's only about one bird every square mile so it's possibly the toughest he goes into all the details about why this is the toughest most challenging bird that a hunter yeah. can bag and I mean these guys are like yeah they have to start their hunt every day with a thousand foot climb and the birds are incredibly smart and uh, he talks about um how how many birds total are have been confirmed hunted and it's like 70 or something like that so you know people go there year after year four and five years just hoping to finally get one and they hunt for 
you know, days, weeks, mm -hmm. and, and are lucky to see one, less, much less get a good shot, much, much less actually pull the shot off. So it's a very good, like, adventure story for people who, um, who maybe don't know much about hunting or think they know all there is to know about hunting, but they haven't bagged a Himalayan snow partridge. Um, anyway, the last story I want to talk about caught me by surprise because I read this book, uh, I bought this book, and I didn't know this was going to be in there, but the story called The Great Jonesboro Pigeon Shoot had me laughing the entire way through. And part of the reason is that it is set in Jonesboro, Tennessee. And uh, I spent a lot of time in Knoxville, Tennessee, which is not that far from Jonesboro. I have friends from Jonesboro. It's the oldest town in Tennessee, and it's one of the best preserved historic towns in America. Mm. Um, and Jonesboro is the home of the International Storytelling Festival, oh, which yeah. happens every fall. And I've been there three or four times. In fact, I covered it when I was a reporter for my university, and then again when I was a, a newspaper reporter for the Knoxville News Sentinel. Uh, I, I, I went there and, and covered it as a feature. Um, so I've been to Jonesboro for the storytelling festival multiple times, and there's some really great storytellers. And they, I mean, they have international storytellers coming in from Ireland and you know all over the place. Hmm. And it's a great event. Jonesboro is a fascinating little town. And but it's it also there's this quirky Southern humor that's in this story that is just in some ways my favorite kind of humor. Uh, um, just to give a few kind of examples. Um, but basically, the story is about the courthouse, which everyone calls the new courthouse, even though it was built in 1912. You know, it's that kind of southern Tennessee, like, kind of, I, I don't know, uh, humor. That um, Anyway, there's a lawyer in town whose name is Friedman Bacon, so everyone calls him Fry Bacon. Mm -hmm. um, and you have, um, you know, characters like the seven-foot-tall policeman, who everyone calls Shorty. Um, and you have uh, the uh, girl who stole a brassiere from a, a, a shop, and in the courthouse, the, the lawyer won't say brassiere because he's uncomfortable with the word, so he calls him a set of briars. You know, just funny stuff like that. So the story uh, it is, <laughs> it actually happened, which is hilarious, is that pigeons were, took over the clock tower of the uh, courthouse, until every hour lasted 80 minutes, and the city council voted 11 to 1 to leave it alone because we need the extra time. Mm. <laughs> and uh, until one day, uh, court is in session, and the roof breaks, and tons of pigeon droppings spill into the courtroom. Oh my. And they decide something has to be done about the pigeons. And it's about a guy who. Uh, moves back into town. He's from Jonesboro. He's been gone all his life. He's getting older. He moves back home. He says, you know, since no one leaves Jonesboro except in a state of acute disgrace, people just assume that I left because of a scandal. So when he comes back, you know, people don't really trust him, even though he's from there. Um, but he decides he's going to get his air rifle and shoot the pigeons from his office, which happens to be the adjacent building. And as soon as he starts to do this, they get a complaint that he's molesting Jonesboro's beloved pigeons. And he tells the police officer, Shorty, who complained? And the police officer says, well, I'm not allowed to say it. He goes, yeah, I know, but tell me anyway. And he tells him. <laughs> and it's just that kind of small town, uh, almost kind of Andy Griffith style right. uh, humor. And it is hilarious. And it, it, um, I won't give away the ending, but the ending has a... A wonderful twist. It, it ends on a on a marvelous twist. But it's about people shooting pigeons with an air rifle, and the town politics, small town politics, get involved. And the fact that it's close to my hometown and very much the culture that I grew up in, and uh, the fact that I've been to the city and that it's all historically accurate, is just makes this. Um, a hilarious, hilarious story, and maybe my my favorite lighthearted story in the collection. But it's a fantastic collection. Again, if you think I'm not really interested in game birds, I don't want to read about people slaughtering mountains of you know uh, uh, birds and and ducks and other game animals. It, it's it's not a technical. This is the kind of gun I used and the gauge and. Uh, this is how I train my dog, and this is where I went, and this is when I took that great trophy, and now I'm so happy that I, I complete. It's not about that. It's about. I mean, one story is about an old man who's been hunting his entire life, and this is his passion, his love, and his health is failing, 
and he's had a lot of medical issues, and he goes on a hunt, and he realizes he's too blind and too deaf and too slow to hunt anymore. And it's just heartbreaking, you know? I mean, it's like yeah. when, when you realize this is my last hunt, this is what I've done my whole life, and this is what I love more than anything, and now I'm too old and broken to do it anymore. And it, it really... It's fantastic collection. I could go on and on about it forever, but you should just buy it and read it. When and was it published? I'm not sure, but the, the publication of each story, uh, are they're wildly different. Some are from, like, the Jonesboro Pigeon Shoot, I believe, was published in 1980. Oh, okay. Whereas, you know, then all the way back to, say, 1850 and some oh. more modern. I believe there's a lot of stories from Outdoor Life magazine and things. They, these are pulled from different sources mm -hmm. and compiled together. It's kind of like the best hunting stories that the editor could uh, could find. And, uh, yeah, I... I certainly think it's one of the best collections of hunting stories you'll come across. And the great thing is because there's 15 stories, if you start reading a story it doesn't grab your attention, I'm not a completionist. So I say just move on to the next one. You know, if a story I think, eh, this one's kind of like a ghost story and it's not really up my alley, just skip it. Go to the next one. You know, read what you like and you don't have to bear through it and martyr yourself to read something that you don't like. Right. In my view. <laughs> All right, what do you got for us today in the nonfiction department? Biography, right? Well, in particular, it is from the genre of rock biography. Okay, what is a um, rock biography? <clears throat> rock and roll biography. Okay, that's what I assumed, yeah. but I didn't know if this was a special term. You've always no, got your I, special terms. No, I love rock bios. Mm -hmm. I, I read as many of them as I can. Well, you're a musician as well. You should probably mention that. Yes. Well, I've read books on... Multiple books on the Beatles, the Stones, Led Zeppelin, Talking Heads, Lou Reed, Iggy Pop, David Bowie, Bob Dylan, and on and on. Okay. Uh, recently, though, I've he's read... He's a connoisseur of the genre, so his that, recommendations that's right. worth a lot. That's right. Recently, I've read some excellent autobiographies. Mm -hmm. uh, Ray Davies of the Kinks, uh, published uh, in, I think, the 80s. Uh, what he called an unauthorized autobiography <laughs> uh, uh, the title of which is X-Ray that's highly recommended okay. of course uh, Miles Davis's autobiography is also a classic uh, that's more of a jazz autobiography than a rock autobiography but <clears throat> we don't need to be that technical uh, and then, uh, also, I recently read the autobiography of Morrissey. Do you know who Morrissey is? I know is? nothing about him. Okay. Also, well, I can't sing or read music or play an instrument. Okay. Well, Morrissey, Morrissey is the... He's probably most famous as the uh, singer and lyricist of the... 1980s band The Smiths mm -hmm. uh, but he's been solo ever since he or ever since The Smiths broke up and so he's you know had a long and distinguished solo career too but uh, he's I guess you could say he's the Oscar Wilde of rock and pop music so uh, and he's a he's a brilliant Writer, it's very witty, epigrammatic. Uh, I'll, I'll read some of the passages to to give you a, a taste of his style. But uh, you know, uh, Bob Dylan proved that songwriting is literature, mm -hmm. and Morrissey is definitely in that tradition too. Like uh, he he's a he's an excellent lyricist and always has been but uh, as he tells the the story of his life from you know basically birth to the present time I think it was published in 2011 mm -hmm. uh, there were there were some I, I'll just share a few of the passages that that were most meaningful to me when he talks about like his early development and you know, how he decided that he wanted to do something with 
words and music as that idea was forming in his mind or in his heart or whatever you want to say, he said to himself, unless I can combine poetry with recorded noise, have I any right to be? Wow. And uh, Talk about a strong sense of mission and purpose. Yeah. And then he, he later developed a sort of formula, blend noise and words and save the world. And Another so I good guess, personal motto. Yeah, I guess that's what he's been doing since then. Uh, later he says, Only the grand completion of a recorded song allows my heart to laugh. Oh. So the, the musician in me certainly appreciates this. The songwriter in me uh, appreciated these passages. But then he also taught, as a famous you know musician himself and a kind of pop icon, he... Uh, met and interacted with a lot of other <clears throat> people in his line of work, right? So uh, some other musicians and artists that I'm interested in, uh, he has some fascinating things to say about them, about Iggy Pop. He says, Iggy does not so much sing as relieve himself. Hmm. And that's he means that as a compliment. But. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and about it could be uh, taken the other way, yeah. but I know what he means. He and uh, gets it out about uh, Lou Reed's former band, The Velvet Underground. He says, and this is also complimentary. The Velvet Underground had been born weary, had found hell within themselves, and they couldn't care less if they made you suffer because their message was simple: you will never have anything. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, and so he, uh, apparently he, uh, ran into David Bowie in a buffet line at some event, and, uh, Morrissey's a, a militant vegetarian, so oh, when he saw, when he saw Bowie looking at the cold cuts, he said, you're not going to eat that, are you? And so I think Bowie was a bit embarrassed and he went over to the fruit and vegetable section but he <laughs> he confided in Morrissey he said you know I've had so much sex and drugs that I can't believe I'm still alive and Mor Morrissey replied you know I've had so little sex and drugs that I can't believe I'm still alive <laughs> oh, that's a that's a great so a uh, quote. yeah uh, and then uh, he he had an inner a uh, an unpleasant interaction with Susie Sue of Susie and the Banshees. Okay. Uh, not one of my favorite artists, but uh, his his description of this encounter is is hilarious. Uh, they they did like a duet together in a video, and it, it was apparently a horrible experience for me. <laughs> so this is this is his uh, reflection on her character of Susie Sue. He says. She looks at everyone and everything only with a sense of what is due to her. Mm. And she might stare you out as you lay dying on a zebra crossing. <laughs> she is certain that her historical value outstrips Queen Victoria's, which, in my meager opinion, it actually does. <laughs> and she has a duty to no one. Hey, don't be talking about Queen Victoria around me. You get steampunk all through over here. Not for a moment will she forget that she is Susie, who might pick fights with people whom her male friends would then beat up. Mm. So not very complimentary, but very, no, that's very scary. entertaining. Scary. Uh, and uh, yeah, one more quote I'll share. This is towards the end. It's, I guess, the summation of, of his life. He says, take it as it is. I am no more unhappy than anyone else. And most humans are wretched creatures, cursed by the sadness of being. The world created me, and I am here, never realizing that I am in love until it gets me into trouble. <laughs> so it's just a very, uh, very, a very engaging style. Uh, yeah. It's a page turner. If you like Morrissey, rock biography, or popular music or just fine writing, I highly recommend it. This is interesting. I saw this in the note, uh, uh, in the credits at the end, there was this note. Mm 
mm-hmm. uh, I guess from the publisher. It says every effort has been made to contact copyright holders. The author and publisher would be glad to amend in future editions any errors or omissions brought to their attention. So, you know, he quotes a lot of poetry and song lyrics and Mm. lines from movies and so on. And then, uh, you know, apparently they got a lot of permission to reprint. But apparently not everything. So they just include this disclaimer, which... Was yeah. a revelation to me because you can you can do that legally. You can just say, "Well, we tried, but you know, we didn't necessarily obtain permission from everyone. If it's a problem, let us know, and we'll fix yeah. it in in future editions." That's yeah. you think that's legally acceptable? I mean, this is this is a this is published by a major. You know, it's G. P. Putnam's. Sons. Mm. That's a a member of the Penguin Group. I mean, this is a major publisher, and I I was just surprised that they could be so casual about it, which leads me to think, hey. Maybe you don't have a choice sometimes, you know? I mean, it's it's like when I was a journalist, you know, you say, we've tried to contact these people, they won't get back to us, so that's why they're not commenting, you know, on this story. I mean, sometimes that's all you can do. But as, as, uh, you know, independent... Authors, uh, I, I at least, uh, well, I've got a work that's coming out in in mid June. I yeah. think you've read it or parts of it, mm-hmm. Flans Day. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's it's uh, based on the works of James Joyce and also uh, Flan O'Brien. And there's a quote from Samuel Beckett too. So, so I actually contacted the agents that represent Flan O'Brien and. Samuel Beckett and I mm-hmm. officially obtained their permission and they told me, you know, how they want me to credit yeah. the their authors. But maybe all I needed to do was say, Oh, every effort <laughs> has been made to contact copyright holders. Oh, but then if you say that you have to actually make every effort. If, if they but say, I, but you I, never what's the me what's the something. effort? I could say, Oh, I emailed and I never heard back. Right, and, right, yeah. I mean sure. I, I didn't know it was it was possible to be so casual about it, but yeah. yeah, I will I will continue to make every effort to you know contact people to contact people whose work I'm quoting from. But there there may be cases where that's not possible. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, and in closing, uh, I just wanted to share my Amazon wish list. This mm. is. I have a, a running list of books that yeah, me too. you know I want to. <laughs> I have like twenty books on my list at any given time. Right. Yeah. So in the in the genre of rock bio or I guess musical bio, I want to read uh, a book about Charles Mingus, the jazz musician, Thelonious Monk, Sun Ra. There's several books on Sun Ra. Uh, Barry Gordy, he's the the founder of Motown Records. Oh, wow. That's a fascinating story. And then uh, probably something on uh, traffic and or Steve Winwood. And oh, Steve Winwood, higher love. Yeah, yeah. Well, but in the early days, he played with a group called Traffic. Oh, okay. And I've been listening to them lately, and I've also been listening to a lot of Deep Purple lately, and um. I'm uh, fascinated by their guitarist Richie Blackmore, so I may look for a a Richie Blackmore biography or autobiography. I'm not sure if there's one out there, but there's probably a band bio on Deep Purple. So yeah, I love me some rock bios, and uh, Morrissey's autobiography is is uh, an excellent example of that genre. You know, if the writing, you know, just from the the quotes that you read, I, I, it sounds like it's one of these books that um, you would enjoy, even if you didn't know anything about music. Because I, mean, I think I, so. I would say this about like Anthony Bourdain's writing. I don't really know or care about cooking. I just right. don't. I've never really been much of a, a cook. But like when I read Kitchen Confidential, just the language of it. You know, sometimes you have people who you know are writers, but they have. 
they're not primarily a writer. They're primarily a chef or a musician. Yeah. And, and yet they also have this talent. You know, it's amazing when somebody can be a great writer and have uh, another uh, skill like that. And sometimes if the writing just sings, it you know, it's it it's becomes captivating, even if you don't know their music or even like their music. Well, yeah, and I'm sure like these stories in the anthology you were talking about, I'm sure I would enjoy some of them too, even though I know very little about hunting. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's true. You don't have to be a hunter or know anything about hunting. In, in fact, one of the delights of it is reading these little tips and tricks, you know, that, oh, like, you know, you got to do this to, you know, you know, the little tips that they do to lure in, you know, animals or they are fascinating to right, non-hunters. Right. People don't know about them, so. Yeah, so that sounds, sounds great. Um, I was going to ask you a question. What are you writing right now? What am I writing right now? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I'm preparing Flans Day for publication, so I'm doing the final edits, or I should say the final, final, final edits. Oh, that's always how it goes. Yeah. Uh, and and goes. also, uh, given the recent uh, political events uh, that uh, we've heard so much about, I'm, I've am i decided that I need to get my translation of Aeschylus Persians out as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, I think you read some yeah. selections. But so I'm working on the the translator's preface or foreword or introduction, and then I'll need to prepare some notes and then proof the translation. But yeah, that I, I'm prioritizing that because uh, you know I think people should know something about the history of Iran. Mm, yeah, and this episode, of course, we're recording this. Several weeks in advance, so you know who knows what will who happen. Who knows what will happen between now and when the, yeah. this video actually uh, releases? So yeah, and you know, um, I, I think it's it's so interesting. Just before we sign off, say that you know I think people could probably tell from our kind of what we read, the kind of stuff we write, and and I think th this has become very interesting to me um, to see. Like I've read your writing. And then I hear about the books that you recommend, and it's so yeah. clear that so much of it is strengthening reading, you know. And that and it, this is almost like I hope we have people watching who are off also writing, and and maybe authors or self-published authors. Yeah. And it, it's you know that's kind of like because I have people who have you know not yet written their first book or you know completed things, and they say, oh, you know, you, you've you know you you put a lot of books out there, you know, and and they say you know that that. That question that everybody asks that's kind of like, it always takes you by surprise no matter how many times you hear it. It's like, oh, what's your tips for writing? And then it's just like, this is kind of it, isn't it? It's like you read a lot in that, um, you know, about the subjects that you're writing about yeah. kind of thing. And then you, um, and so you can see from our recommendation, you know, if you like the kind of books I recommend, you're probably going to like my novels. If you like the books uh, that uh, Mark recommends, you're probably going to really like his work. So, you know, this is... This is kind of the author's life, isn't it? You know, that's why I've been really happy to do this YouTube channel in addition to um, writing. Because this is like actually a fun break from being behind the keyboard all the time. Yeah. All right. Well, signing off. Uh, please, the best thing you can do to help us out is uh, subscribe. To well, the best thing you can do to help us out is leave reviews on our books on Amazon and elsewhere. Um, but uh, please help our YouTube channel grow by uh, subscribing, liking the videos, and sharing the videos with all your friends and with all your enemies. <laughs>